really happy that we have uh, all of our participants and we have it, uh, with us uh, a, a good number of people as uh, attendees. So uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome everyone to this uh, first Max Planck lecture of the year, and it is an alumni event of the Max Planck Institute Luxembourg uh, for procedural law, uh, because Alessandra Donati, the author of the book we are going to talk about during this uh, uh, lecture, uh, was uh, a research fellow and then a senior research fellow at the Max Planck Institute in uh, in uh, in my team in the Department of International Law and Dispute Resolution for several years. And uh, she has uh, left us to become a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Luxembourg. So by the way, she is still in the same building, but nevertheless uh, working for another um, entity here in, uh, in, in Luxembourg. However, during her time at the Institute, she, especially when she was research fellow, she wrote her, her PhD or doctoral dissertation that she defended at the University of Paris one a bit more than two years ago now. And uh, then, uh, like many uh, young doctors, she she worked uh, uh, quite hard to to uh, convert it into a manuscript, uh, which is now published, uh, as you see, by uh, Brilliant. And uh, so uh, the manuscript is is uh, in French, as the thesis was defended at the University of Paris One. Uh, Panthéon Sorbonne, but uh, the lecture of today is uh, is in English and uh, according to the working language of uh, of uh, the uh, institute. So I will not take too much of your time, except to, uh, of course, thank very much uh, Alessandra for uh, choosing uh, the institute and the alumni uh, lecture series uh, to to present her book, and also thank very warmly uh, Professor Joanne Scott from the European University Institute and Professor Nicolas de Sadler from the University of Brussels to have accepted to be discussant and uh, to to engage in this conversation with Alessandra on the precautionary uh, principle under uh, European uh, Union law. So uh, as we did in, in previous uh, events at the same time, we will begin with the presentation of the, of the book by the author, by Alessandra, uh, following which we will have the dialogue with the, the two uh, discussants. So without waiting for more than that, and that without uh, uh, forgetting as well to wish all of you a very happy new year if I have not had the opportunity to do so uh, before. I give the floor to uh, Alessandra. Thank you very much, Hélène. Um, before starting, I really want to take a few seconds to say thank you uh, to Hélène and the Max Planck. As Hélène said before moving a few months ago to the University of Luxembourg, uh, the Max Planck being at the Max Planck for more than five years, and it is in this really incredible working place that I worked, wrote, finished my PhD, and then uh, developed and published this book. So without Elena de Max Planck, and it's not just for saying we, I would not be here today. And a big thank also to Jan Scott and Nicolas de Sadler. Um, I have to say that you've been my reference even before meeting you in person for the writing of my book. So I'm really happy and honored to have you here today. And uh, last but not least, I want to say hi and thank you to all the friends and colleagues that I see connected that have witnessed the production of this book and also to the other people that I still don't know yet, but I see, uh, but took the time to be here uh, today. That's enough with my thank you. So I can start with the presentation and I will share uh, with you my screen. So, um, my presentation is structured as follows. After an introduction in which I will um, explain the foundations of my work on the precautionary principle, we will focus in part one and part two on the main uh, pillars of the precautionary principle, anticipation and action before uh, concluding. Introduction. Um, since the very beginning, since the 80s, the precautionary principle has been largely invoked in many environmental and health uh, crises and, and with regard to environmental and health risks, from the beef cow crisis in the UK to GMO, pesticide, climate change, and more recently, even COVID-19, the precautionary principle has always been on the edge. So the question arises, why a PhD and why a book on a topic that has been so largely 
uh, described and uh, discussed. The reason why I decided I chose this topic, and I think it's really uh, it's a worth topic for discussion, is that the more we speak about the precautionary principle, the more its interpretation, the more its conditions for applications um, become unclear and, not, and, and unprecise. And it's so true that some scholars consider that there might be not one precautionary principle, but many precautionary principles to underline the, the differences and the divergences in the conditions for application of this principle under EU law. That's why the starting point of my research is the, um, is the acknowledgement of the need um, for a shift in the way in which precaution is traditionally interpreted. Because I think that uh, in, a, in a, an explication of the way in with the reason why precaution is so badly understood and so rarely even applied, think about pesticides or think about climate change, or even COVID, the case in which it was applied was really late, as we will see in the second part of the presentation. A part of the explanation is because precaution is not well understood. And for me, understanding the precautionary principle means uh, acknowledging, acknowledging the postmodern nature of this principle. Since the 70s, we have um, progressively acknowledged the uh, incapacity of modern society, of a society based on a strong belief in reason, science, and an idea of progress considered to be able to uh, be based on a reasonable and a limited use of natural resources. Since the 70s, these ideas have progressively been questioned. Uh, the, the focus is more and more on uncertainty, on the doubts on the capacity of science to justify and back up a progress on the acknowledgement of the limited use of nat natural resources. And all these elements you, uh, together with the, uh, all the environmental and the health uh, crises that we have met and together with the process of progressive globalization brought to a, a reconsideration of the paradigm of modern society towards a new paradigm of postmodern society. Of course, modern and postmodern shall not be read in terms of substitution, but more in terms of um, interaction. So postmodern society is meant to respond, to be able to respond better to the new challenges of our current society. And of course, these changes also have an impact on law. If the, tra the traditional idea of law as a pyramid of norm, where general, hierarchical, and linear rules can describe in a very precise way the way in which the legal system uh, works, is progressively replaced by the idea of a network. Network is an open system where different actors, different level of regulations, national, international, but also state and non-state actors interact. It is in this context that I think we shall interpret the precautionary principle, because the precautionary principle is a typical postmodern principle. Why? Mainly because it is a flexible and complex principle. It is a flexible principle because it is a soft principle. If you look at the norm that regulates the precautionary principle under EU law, and namely Article 191 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, you will see that there are no references to the conditions for the application of this principle. And so a huge discretionary power is given to the decision makers that shall decide on a case-by-case -case basis if and how precaution shall apply. But it is also a soft principle uh, because it's very difficult to sanction a breach of precaution. There are very few cases in which the extra contractual responsibility of the institutions is engaged, but also very, but also difficult to sanction in the framework of an action for annulment, the precaution. But it's also and finally a soft principle because that we will see um, the binding nature of precaution if it has been largely uh, discussed, it is today recognized, but limited mostly to the procedural side. For all these reasons, precaution is an adaptable principle. I tried with all my force to find a catalog of precautionary measures, but it's not the case. So precaution does not have as an open content, which changes according to the specific condition of risk and uncertainty. But it's also a complex principle, a complex principle in its dimension of plural principle. Plural means interdisciplinary principle. Precaution is a legal principle, but speaking about precaution means also reflecting over the relations between law, science, politics, moral, ethics, sociology. And it's a plural principle which is applied at different level of regulations. And it's also an, an, an negotiable principle. We all say 
that precaution is a risk management tool applied by the political decision makers, but without science, as we'll see, precaution um, loses its meaning. And so by the negoci negotiation between scientific experts and political decision makers, we can really understand the essence of precaution. So taking into account the flexibility and complexity of precaution, the goal of my research was to try to find a plural, complex, dynamic, polycentric, but order definition of precaution. So what I wanted to the challenge was not to resign to the, uh, to the statement that there are many precautionary principles. I do think that there's one precautionary principle, but it's not possible to define and, and enclose precaution in one unique, clear, and static definition. The definition that I look for and I will propose to you today and that I propose in my book is rather a, a, a complex and polycentric definition. So what you could ask me is how did you do that from the methodological perspective? Um, I, what I did is making reference to the methodological pluralism, which is the translation in methodological terms of postmodern uh, theories, which says that uh, if the purpose is to find um, the unitas multiplex, the, the order, the poly a polycentric definition, you should not just find focus on one methodology, but rather use a different set, a criteria of methodology that will allow you weaving the network of precaution. So weaving and this textile metaphor is really at the sense of the work that I did on precaution. And the images that I put you on the slide are not by chance because what I really did is trying to weave the network of the precautionary principle by identifying the nuts and the links of the network. What do I mean by these, uh, these terms? The nuts are the main concept that will allow you understanding uh, the precautionary principle under EU law. So if you want to navigate in the net, well, you need to find stable elements of interpretation and application that will give you a guidance between the different applications and interpretation of this principle. But these knots are not isolated. They are connected the one to the others with some links. The links are kind of um, information vehicles by looking at uh, the quantity and quality of the information given by the available sources and namely so uh, the case law of the Court of Justice, um, legislation, EU legislation, and the scholarship, I tried to see, you, you, clearly what came out was that all the knots were connected the one to the other according to different, to different, the different uh, strengths. So I classified some links as weak, strong, or absent, depending on the quantity and quality of information available. And this these, these distinction is important because it also explained the kind of work that I did. I will come back later with some examples to clarify what I'm saying, but uh, just to let you know, I considered that the link was strong when, uh, for example, when the, um, the relationship between two knots was clearly established. So uh, the knot, for example, the link between risk and uncertainty is considered to be strong because if you look at the court of the, the case of the court of justice, it comes out very clearly that risk and uncertainty are the conditions for applying the precautionary principle. And in this case, my work consisted in explaining, in giving a voice, in, in um, presenting the, what already exists in the case law or in the current literature. When two links are considered to be, I consider two links to be weak, for example, the link between uh, the implementation of precaution and the carrying out of a cost and benefit uh, analysis, the kind of work that I did was not just limited to coordinating what already exists, but I tried to do a step more, trying to unify, to harmonizing two concepts that they were a little bit different. So and harmonizing, I use it in an improper way by saying that by harmonization, I mean the attempt to find common elements, to find the relation and to put so little step forward in the, uh, in the st current status of, of scholarship. When a, when a link is con considered to be absent because two elements of the precautionary principle network are not today linked, but may be worth to do so. So the core claim of my research in this context is that all these knots and the links are not linked to the other in a casual way, but they respond to a specific dynamic, which is typical of the hubs and spoke theory. The hubs and spoke theory is rarely used in law. It's mainly used in transportation system think about namely the air transport system in the air transport our air transport system the small airports are connected to big airports which are called the hubs 
So the airports are not connected all the one to the others, but they are connected to main hubs that regulate the circulation between all the different smaller airports. That's exactly um, the metaphor that explained what I did with the precautionary principle. At the end of the day, the, 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 the network of the precautionary principle can be divided into two separate networks that belong respectively to the nuts, anticipation and action. So there's not a ring, a kind of ring uh, chart, but it's more a hats and theory stats chart. To, to give you um, a visual image of what I did, I will now move um, to the anticipation and the and action uh, chart. So anticipating means, and I forgot to say, sorry, that the idea of making all the, creating these dynamics and interpreting these dynamics is to say that if the main hubs of the precautionary principle network are anticipation and action, this means that the polycentric but order definition of precaution is the one that says that precaution is a principle of anticipated action. In which sense? And that's what exactly what I'm going to explain to you in the first and second part. Anticipated means for the decision makers to act based on uncertain risks. Which uncertain risks? The uncertain risks that have been qualified by law and evaluated by science. That's why if you look at the chart, the qualification by law and evaluation by science of uncertain risks are the two main knots connected to the hub anticipation. The link is blue because they consider that this is a weak link because they're not enough this, this, because the available sources do not, do not converge or are not entirely consistent in the way in which uh, uncertain risks are qualified and evaluated by science. If you moved forward on the right side, and I will not explain you or the chart for lack of time, but just to give you more example, if you think about um, the evaluation by science of uncertain risks, what does evaluating as a risk mean? And so who are the experts? And who are, how, the, is the, how the expertise is made? Again, um, if it is clear that the risk assessment is a precondition for execute forum, applying the precautionary principle, you will be surprised to see there are very few references under EU scholarship to the conditions that the experts and the expertise shall, shall respect. That's why the link connected these knots to the knot evaluation by science is, 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 uh, is considered to be weak. And so and so on, but so on, so on, with a progressive work of deconstruction, I went on by understanding for each knot which were the respective uh, components. For example, for the experts, I try, if there's not a catalog of experts, what I ask myself is, if it's not possible to identify a list of experts, which are the conditions that the experts shall respect? And the answer is separation and independence. The same kind of works has been made for the second uh, component of the precautionary principle, action. So what does acting mean on the basis of precautionary principle means? I do believe that there must be, there's a difference between the procedural and the substantive side. From the procedural side, the decision makers have an obligation to take into account the precautionary principle, which means that they shall respect a set of obligations, namely the obligation to take into account the scientific expertise and the obligation to take into account the other non-scientific uh, pros and cons of the action. And the obligation to take into account the scientific expertise, I'm on the, on the, on the, on the, up, up, on the upper part of my chart, mainly uh, implies a duty of care, a duty of motivation. So it means that if the conduct of a risk assessment is the condition for execute or apply the precautionary principle, even if we are in a condition of risk and uncertainty, the decision maker shall take into account um, the entirety of the risk assessment made by experts, they shall not avoid a uh, part, they shall, we, we, they shall exercise their diligence and their care in examining this document. And of course, they shall duly motivate this, uh, this decision. And this applies both for the first risk assessment made before the application of precaution and for the, any other risk assessment that shall change and evaluate shall during, evaluate during the application of precaution. But once they've complied with this procedural obligation, they are free on the substantive side to decide which kind of measure. That's why at the very beginning I said that there's not a catalog of precautionary measure, but the precaution is an open content and the decision maker enjoy 
a wide discretionary uh, power in changing, in choosing uh, which kind of measure. Precaution, discre discretionary power, which is also confirmed by the limited extent and intensity of the control exercised uh, by the Court of Justice. So uh, moving to the conclusion, because I don't want to monopolize uh, the discussion with my presentation, uh, which are the next steps? The next steps for precaution and the next steps for my own research. The next step for precaution, which correspond for me to the main challenge that this principle um, knows today, I think lies in its regime of responsibility. As I said at the very beginning, um, precaution is often not applied or applied very late. Uh, life as it is the best case in which we can say precaution was not applied. We were in 2017 in a, when the commission decided to renew the authorization of life as it in a condition of risk and uncertainty. Precaution should have been applied, but it was not. There were many attempts by the European Parliament and by several um, applicants to make to have the decision of the commission to renew life as a challenge by the Court of Justice. They all failed. We are, we are waiting for this year, at the end of 2022, a new decision by the European Commission that shall decide whether or not glyphosate will be renewed again for the next uh, period. We will see if this time precaution might or not find uh, a place. And this is possible again, and I, I, I remain to the main challenge because the system of responsibility is still too uh, weak. It is weak, namely, to engage the responsibility of the European institutions. At my knowledge, there's only one case in which uh, on more than 1,000 cases that I examined that in which the European institutions have been sanctioned for breaching a precautionary principle. Next steps for my own research, I think what would be interesting for me is to apply this network, this model to um, new directions, both from a material and a personal perspective. From a personal perspective, I think there might be new um, venues for discussion, thinking about, for example, uh, the relationship between precaution and future generations. That's in this line that the project we are conducting with Len and Valeria de Max Planck, where we are studying um, the uh, protection of future, protection mean where we study, you're comparing the tools for protecting future generations and past generations, but also way uh, of uh, understanding if and how precaution might be applied by private companies. In the framework of corporate sustainability, in the framework of the new directive that will be very soon implemented, imposing new obligations of care and diligence on the company, I think that precaution might be, have a role to play. Last, I think that it could be interesting also to enlarge the material scope for the application of precaution and to test this network. Just give you an example, uh, climate risks. If you think about climate risks as transitional risks, and where transitional risks, I mean, I mean not only risks that have an environmental and health dimension, but also an economic one. If you look at the, the case of the Court of Justice, you would say that precaution cannot apply to these economic dimensions because uh, it is strictly applied in environmental and public health uh, cases. But I think that in cases like climate change, in which the economic and social dimension is strictly connected to the environmental one, there might be a venue uh, to think about new applications uh, of this principle. So I will stop here. I thank you very much for your attention and I leave the floor to Joanne and Nicola uh, for discussion. Thank you very much. Very uh, dynamic and, and at the same time complex uh, presentation. So um, uh, and we'll, I uh, pass immediately the floor to Joanne Scott to present her comments and uh, maybe challenge some of your uh, <laughs> statements on, the, on this uh, complex study. Joanne, you have the, the floor. Great, great. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Thank you, uh, Alessandra. And thank you very much for the invitation to comment on Alessandra's groundbreaking work on the precautionary principle and the opportunity to join in this uh, discussion today. So let me start by saying that I think that Alessandra has offered us a sophisticated and original, by no means easy, analysis of the precautionary principle in EU law. And I think she succeeds in her aim of capturing the complexity of the, com of the concept whilst retaining enough order to make it possible for judges to render the principle operational. 
In this sense, Alessandra offers a quite gentle and quite reassuring vision of postmodern law. She draws on the theory of nodal governance and offers lessons for us all in how to use theory effectively to inform her analysis in a way that contributes to its originality, but also using her specific inquiry into the nature of the precautionary principle to help build the theory of nodal governance, particularly because of the emphasis she places upon the nature and strength of the links established between the different knots. Although Peter Drahosh is one of my colleagues at the EUI and one of the, the fathers of nodal governance, to my shame, I am not expert at all in the theory of nodal governance. So let me start by asking Alessandra for some clarification about the key concept of a knot, a knot with a K rather than a knot with an N. Uh, Boris and his co-authors conceive of a knot as an instrument of governance or an instrument of action. The instrument they tell us may be political, legal, economic, military, and so on. In keeping with the concept of regulatory pluralism inherent in postmodern law, Alessandra tells us that knots can take many forms, government agencies, businesses, NGOs. So I was left wondering about the very essence of the concept. Are knots actors or are knots instruments? Or rather, can they best be conceived as a multi-dimensional constellation of what we can call action-oriented resources? So action, so actors and instruments and more, including what Alexander refers to as action points or action triggers. It took me a little, little bit of time when reading the paper, although um, reading the, the written work, although much clearer today in the presentation, to figure out the distinction between a hub and a knot. So in your diagram, it could be really useful to, to sort of just clarify that slightly, because I found myself just for a minute going round in circles trying to figure that out. But then when I figured out that anticipation and action were hubs and not knots, everything suddenly fell into place for me. Alessandra's diagrams, though they're complex, are actually incredibly useful in helping the reader to understand the complexity of the precautionary principle and the overall nature of her project. I, I really think they work. I think they're incredibly helpful. The diagrams chart very carefully the nature of the horizontal linkages between the hub on the left-hand side and the decomposed elements of precaution, which gain in specificity as we move from left to right. What Alessandra doesn't do, I don't think, and probably she has a very good reason for this, is to seek to trace the vertical linkages. For example, the linkage between the legal dimension of uncertain risks, and the scientific dimension of uncertain risks. Now, when I listened to your presentation, it struck me that that just may be a product of moving from your network metaphor to your diagram, because in the, in the network metaphor that you use, there is no vertical and horizontal, that distinction gets collapsed. But in this, you're presented with what seems like a vertical and horizontal distinction. So why would it matter that Alessandra hasn't traced the vertical as opposed to the horizontal links. And she can tell me that I'm entirely missing the point. If part of the purpose is to ensure that the precautionary principle is not only recognized as complex, but also as capable of being operationalized despite that complexity, does the decision maker not need to understand also the vertical linkages, as well as the horizontal linkages. When are they alternatives? When are they cumulative? These different elements that make up the precautionary principle. When are they reinforcing? When are they in tension? And I thought by tracking the vertical linkages, we could learn a little bit more about that. One feature of the project that I particularly liked was the idea, and Alessandra just referred to this, that 
there are links that still need to be built. And if I'm not mistaken in the diagrams that she presented today, there is only one unbuilt link um, that is identified. And, and this was referred to. The missing link is the law of future generations, which emerges from the precautionary principles goal to protect future generations. This made me wonder whether the principles goals, whether the precautionary principles goals or objectives merit a more prominent place in Alexandra's analysis. Should these goals do more than simply inform the qualification by law of uncertain risk, which is how they're conceived at the moment? If not are viewed as constellations of action-oriented resources, they are linked together with each other and with the hubs in light of the governance system's overarching goals, one of which Alessandra tells us very importantly is to protect future generations. So I couldn't quite figure out the implications of thinking, but the goals need to have a more prominent position in the analysis but I kind of wanted them to be on both sides of the diagram. You know, I wanted the goals to sort of be the foundation for the hubs and all the different elements that are connected to the hubs. But I also wanted the goals to be on the other side, to be the thing that we want, the thing, the things that we want to achieve through the application of the precautionary principle. So I, I felt like the goals should play a more overarching role in the framework rather than the, the rather confined role that they play at the moment. Moving on to my final point, which is a little bit related. Alessandra tells us in her written work that she can imagine a world in which the precautionary principle remains very static or relatively static under EU law but also one in which it may evolve in either a regressive or a progressive direction. So I would like to hear more about what Alessandra has to say about the criteria that she uses to determine whether legal developments in this area should be viewed as progressive or regressive. And I think that takes us back precisely to the question of the principles overarching goals. But related to this, can I also ask about the normative impact or implications of Alessandra's scholarship? Alessandra aims to make the precautionary principle tractable for decision makers, while not ignoring its complexity. But tractability can itself be viewed as a form of governance, as action shaping or action steering behavior. To the extent that the common elements that currently make up the precautionary principle in the EU law legal order, as identified by Alexander, are not progressive or not sufficient to achieve their goals, or to the extent that they operate in pursuit of inadequate goals, for example, where does the protection of non-human species uh, find expression within those goals at the current time? Is there not a danger that the very tractability that Alexandra's research project provides might serve to inhibit, to reinforce, and to inhibit rather than to promote an appropriately progressive articulation of the precautionary principle? But these are open questions stimulated by Alexandra's thoughtful work. And it was a real pleasure to read her work, albeit for me, time consuming to read in the French version and to hear her speak today. She is a truly brilliant and gifted scholar, and I will follow with the greatest of pleasure and interest her research in the future. So thank you very much for the invitation to take part today. Thank you very much, Joanne, for all this, these comments. And there were so, so many questions. My, my, my initial idea was that I would move on to Nicolas to comment. But there, I think that uh, Alessandra has already uh, a lot of questions on her plate. So if, if Nicolas doesn't mind, I will give the floor to Alessandra uh, to, 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 to answer immediately, as we are still in, in the logic of, of your uh, comments. So Alessandra. Sandra, please. 
Thank you, Joanne. Thank you very much for all these very rich and uh, comments. Um, I will give you a preliminary answer, but I think I will remain thinking about your question that, of course, uh, will shape also the trajectory. I don't want to see a progression of my <laughs> research, but yeah. So um, what I mean by not, um, as you said, I, 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 the inspiration for my work came from the work of Peter Drouse on nodal governance. But then I freely adapted its theory to my own. So I cannot, I really would say that it was um, the reading that changed my perspective, but I cannot really say it's a proper application of nodal governance. Because Peter Rouse, Barris, and the others say that nodes are um, elements of action and they mean action in a very uh, broad sense. As you said, it could be business, companies, agencies. So there are ways, there are, um, both actors and instruments in their theory that um, allows for a change in the direction in which a certain social system is working or interpreted. So the way in which I intend and not is also, I could say, in a imprecise way, an element of action, because it's an action in the sense that it allows for um, the understanding of a specific application of precaution. But I would say that it's more a multidimensional element. I cannot say it's not rather an, act, an actor or an instrument. It's really an element of consistency and coherence. And to understand so the perspective that I took, as you said several times, is the one of decision makers. Maybe because of my experience as a lawyer, I really found necessary to put some clarity in this complex order and to say, if I am the European Commission or the court, I in the need to apply precaution, what shall I do? And so also the knots and the links, and now I'm responding to the other comments, are not the only one possible. I think if you think about the network, there could be different knots and different links. And of course, this is an open texture. So I would like to create new venues of interaction. The ones that I, that, I, that I described are the ones that from the perspective of the decision makers allows for me for a complex but ordered application of uh, the precautionary principle. And yes, and I have to be honest, the goal one are the, the part of the project that have been the most, well, most difficult to place. Because I agree with you that they should play an overarching uh, role. Um, the way, the reason why I put them in the anticipation part as part of the qualification by law is because when you think about the qualification and you think about so the risk and uncertainty, they say, okay, precaution A applies when there's a risk and there's an uncertainty, but why? And the aim is to protect the environment, public health, and it's really uh, the way in which the reason why precaution has been applied. But there's also more. And this refer the reference to future generations, which um, it is um, conceived in the first way, on the one hand, as a way to achieving sustainable development. That's where we are today. But there's more and more. Even if we move from the notion of sustainable development to the one of ecological transition, what's next? So once the transition, hopefully there will be a next after the transition. Well, what will be the next? And the next is the future generations. And this link is one, the one of the few, the one link that I consider to be absent, but worth of creation. Um, there could be more. And I think about when I said the new challenges, for example, applying precaution to private decision makers could be, is an absent link today, but could perfectly um, feel uh, within the network. Um, on the dynamic of the networks, uh, vertical or horizontal dynamic, um, the chart is of course a simplification. So um, I don't, I don't want, I didn't engage in a difference between horizontal and verticality. I think that what I think is that, and it's important to say that all the knots are not linked the one to the other, and they really, in my reasoning, they are respond to a habit and spoke uh, dynamic. Then within these nuts, the same idea of horizontally and verticality, I think um, it's, an, it's a more a modern way of understanding movement. So there's not a need to say horizontal or verticality, there's a movement within the network and, and that connection. And the difference between nuts and hats, maybe it was not enough clear, but um, for me, even anticipation and action, they are all nuts. 
the hubs responds to the way in which they, they, they move within the network. So it's the dynamics that uh, allows for identification of anticipation and action as hubs. So anticipation and action are not like the others because they correspond to, to key element for the interpretation of precaution. But because there are the main nodes that regulate the circulation within all the network, they work as if they were uh, hubs. Um, and last question on progression or regression. I think it's difficult to qualify progression or regression. What I meant by that is that um, there are always uh, critiques that always attempt uh, to, to uh, neutralize the application of the precautionary principle. The traditional one, for example, is by saying that if we introduce in EU law a principle of innovation, the principle of innovation will be the death of precaution. I don't think so. I think that innovation and precaution could, be, could go hand in hand uh, because the technological progress cannot be, shall be accompanied, accompanied by an idea of protection of our environment and public health. But as precaution is always also subject, subject a sensitive topic, uh, there might be that, and also depending on the political context, its applications might be uh, might may, might need might know a regression. A progression for me uh, could be in the, is in the sense of a strengthening of the principle. Another example um, we all discuss a lot about the principle of non-regression, the introduction of the EU law of a principle of non-regression. If this could be, was the case, I think that, for example, could be, could go in the sense of a progression of the principle or a consolidation. Because the principle of non-regression, which would say that we shall not, uh, we shall preserve, preserve the, uh, the level, the achieved level of protection of the environment without the possibility of going back, would be a way to say, we achieved a certain level of protection, we can go back. And of course, if the level of protection is set, it was also easier uh, to use precaution by anticipating the time of action, but also taking into account uh, uncertain risks. So I uh, will stop here, I could go a uh, bit longer, but I think we will have a separate discussion uh, on that. But thank you very much, Jan, for re taking the time to read, uh, especially in French, and uh, to be here today. I'm really, really happy to have you here. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sure that John uh, you know, will have the opportunity to take the floor uh, again. Uh, I seize the opportunity to, to, to mention to the attendees that they can ask a question through the, 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 the chat or the Q&A, which are uh, available. So do not hesitate to do so, or eventually to... And, um, and now I will turn to Nicolas de, de Sadler, who knows well the work because he, he wrote the foreword to, to, to the book. So I guess he has some ideas. Uh, Nicolas, I'm happy to give you the floor for your comments. Uh, yeah, yes, I, I shall put forward a, but a few observations. Um, it, it seems to me that the, the, the key difficulties to operate uh, precaution uh, relates to the the, the, the manner in which uh, uncertainty unfolds. Uh, let's look at uh, ecology. Uh, uncertainty related to ecosystem resilience or to dynamic of populations um, does not unfold uh, similarly. Uh, regarding products, uncertainties uh, regarding the dissemination of GMOs uh, differ uh, from the uncertainty related to chemical substances. Uh, and um, given that uh, precaution can apply in areas ranging from fisheries to nature conservation or um, listed installation, um, it uh, compounds the, the complexity of the uh, application. Uh, secondly, uh, it seems to me that the standards of review that have been uh, set forth by the European Commission in the early 2000s and that have been to some extent embraced by the General Court in Luxembourg uh, since the uh, Pfizer judgments um, are rather broad. Um, in other words, uh, the standards of review um, can uh, give the um, European Commission some leeway in regulating the risks, 
uh, but it can also allow uh, the uh, general court, uh, the court of justice, to nullify uh, some um, measures. So I, I would like just to mention uh, two recent judgments. Uh, the, the one on um, decided on the 17th of March, uh, 21, by the general court uh, regarding the uh, FPS substance that's uh, broadly used uh, in herbicides, not anymore in Europe, but mostly uh, outside of Europe. And um, to simplify a complex matter is that the European Commission decided uh, not uh, to authorize to continue to authorize the substance uh, in the uh, under the list of Annex One of the uh, pesticide regulations, and uh, regarding the metabolites, uh, the metabolites of the um, uh, substance at stake, the European Commission has no data to demonstrate that these metabolites uh, were carcinogenic for the mammals as well as toxic for the reproductions of uh, human beings. So the uh, whole approach of the European Commission, reckoning upon the um, uh, chemical agency's work, was uh, to look at the intrinsic properties of the mother substance, so the, the uh, contained in the, the pesticides. And the general courts uh, agreed with the, this approach in uh, arguing that the precautionary principles was uh, actually um, uh, giving the leeway uh, to the European Commission as a risk manager to um, take into consideration the more general risk stemming from the substance in uh, reaching the conclusions that the metabolites were uh, actually at risk, whilst there was no scientific demonstration of the risk posed by the metabolite. But in sharp contrast, on the 31st of October, the, uh, the Court of Justice uh, decided in a case client earth against commissions regarding uh, another substance that's used to uh, soften the uh, PVC, the, the, the plastics, um, in the uh, framework of a recycling operation. And uh, the general court uh, is reckoning upon a literal uh, interpretation of um, uh, different um, um, regulations in weighing the uh, opposing risks, instead of embracing a, a theological uh, interpretation. And uh, the, the core of the issue was that uh, the uh, endocr endocrine uh, disrupting uh, effect of, the, of that substance uh, was not listed uh, by the chemical agency uh, in one of the annexes. So uh, the agency, uh, as well as the commission, uh, focused only on a risk for reproduction and not an endocrine disrupting risk. And so the, the Court of Justice agreed uh, with the European Commission that there was no obligation whatsoever to uh, encompass, to um, uh, a, a more general approach of risk. So to some extent, it's uh, dismissing uh, the precautionary approach. So we, we just faced in a few months uh, um, a, a very um, contrasting uh, judicial approach. And, and it seems to me that uh, the, the standards of for, for review are so broad that uh, the, the General Court, as well as the Court of Justice, um, are endowed with some leeway um, to um, review uh, the measures uh, enacted by the uh, European Commission. Uh, my third observation is it's, it's what really matters is the, uh, the, the variety and the complexity of pathways of dispersions of substances um, that we are facing and uh, the, the variety uh, and the complexity just compound uh, the, 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 the uncertainty that's triggering uh, precautions. So we, we are constantly moving uh, from a world uh, under, in which the, 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 the risk uh, we, we do manage uh, to some control into a world where the uh, complexity uh, dominated. And what's striking is the is our limited knowledge, uh, not only in, in the field of substances, 
uh, but also in the field of uh, climate change or uh, biodiversity being uh, impacted by uh, different um, uh, pressures. So na nature does not reveal its uh, secrets um, quickly. And uh, I will have to confess that uh, looking at the Green Deal, so uh, you mentioned the green transition, uh, this is going to take years. Uh, it's a fairly long process and the objective won't be achieved um, or the, 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 the closest objective won't be achieved before five to 10 years. So um, what, what, what matters is to take into consideration the accumulation of impacts uh, stemming from different activities, stemming from different substance, uh, widespread in the environment on ecosystem and also on human beings. And um, so my, my question is, how, how can we um, try to achieve um, a high level of protection, which is seems to me uh, amounting to a constitutional duty with um, the, 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 the sheer complexity of the natural world that uh, subject um, for these last decades to significant transformation. So the, 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 the level of, um, of uh, human-made pressure on the natural world has never been so significant than today. And this is not only uh, the rising of temperature and the consequences upon um, a different ecosystem. It's, it's the, 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 the sheer occupation of the land, of the soils uh, by human activities. And um, so to conclude with, it seemed to me that on, on the one hand, uh, both the commission and the courts have been endorsing a, a, a rather a broad um, review uh, approach, uh, giving some leeway. But the, the commission is an executive that's subject to agency capture, uh, as well as the other regulatory agency uh, in the EU. So. Um, and that gives rise to, to a question of trust, the extent to which um, a citizen can trust its administration. And how to cope with extremely fast uh, uh, ecological changes? Because what, what's taking me by surprise, and, and that's a view shared by many scientists, uh, it's a view shared in the literature, is the, the speed with which uh, the events unfold. Quite a different challenge in terms of questions. That, that's fascinating in my view as a listener because I can see how comments can be, <clears throat> sorry, different. And so at the same time, I think it shows all the attendees that uh, your book is, is so rich that you can have uh, very different uh, readings. So it, it is an even more encouragement to, to, to read. But Alessandra, I let you answer the questions. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you for your questions. Uh, and more, uh, for your comments. I would comment over your, your comments. The, the first one on the... Um, on the uh, judicial control over the precautionary principle. I agree with you that the two cases, that the very recent cases that you mentioned are perfect examples of the great variety uh, in the way in which the court of justice uh, checks the precautionary measure. However, um, uh, in, my, in the review that I made of all the different cases that were uh, uh, judged by the court of justice, and I really took the time to go uh, through all of them until, until uh, last last year, um, when I, when my book was edited was was published. Um, I think there, there are two uh, big trends in this variety, which also explain the again I give you an uh, an. Uh, an idea of the kind of work they did by looking for these elements of coherence in a very fragmented uh, picture. The first trend is that is a constant uh, attempt to proceduralize uh, the control. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, there was more and more, I think, a focus on procedural obligations, as I said before. The control of the precautionary measure really becomes a, a control by the court and by the general court to the procedural obligation. Did the court, it's kind of a checklist. Did the commission uh, took into consideration with care the specific expertise made by the expert? Yes. Did the commission uh, reviewed with care the, the, uh, any new scientific evidence which uh, appeared after the first expertise was, was ready. Was and is this more recently after the Bayer uh, judgment of 2018, which was confirmed even this year by the Court of Justice, that is that did the, court, the commission uh, engage in a cost and benefit analysis in which, which, is, the, which is not intended um, as an, a pure economic cost and benefit analysis, but more as a balance of interest of a balance of non-scientific factors. And if this element, if this checklist, uh, at the end of this checklist, the answer is yes, so the precautionary measure is considered to be uh, compliant with all the many cases, uh, with this trend of uh, cases decided by the Court of Justice. And the, the, I think the focus on procedural obligation is so uh, strong that someone may wonder if we're still in the framework of a limited uh, control. Because we are in a condition of scientific uncertainty in which the decision makers enjoy a wide discretionary power. And so according to the case law, the court of justice, the court shall limit its control to limited control. A limited control aimed at, at verifying if there is a manifest breach of the, uh, the wide discretionary power. And so the question that I also ask myself is by, is by, if we focus so much on procedural obligation, can we really say that we are still in the paradigm of a limited control? Um, there are many divergent opinions in scholarship on, the, on this point. I do believe that, yes, if you look at the, court, the, the case law, at least uh, the, uh, the discourse which is made by the Court of Justice is that we are still in the framework of a limited uh, control and that the reference to procedural obligation does not change the intention of the court to focus on your manifest breach. But of course, there's a leeway uh, to discuss on this point. And the second uh, main uh, strand that I find is that there's a progressive attempt to make the control more and more scientific. So there's more and more willingness by the courts also to engage in the um, interpretation of scientific notion, which is very, uh, which might be uh, tricky or dangerous considering that the court of justice are not scientific expertise, but which is also, and I guess, uh, necessary if, as you said, uncertainty is playing more and more role. It is all, even more difficult to, I guess, understand, interpret, scientific uncertainty and risks. So there's a need somehow for the court to engage with scientific uh, ex expertise. Uh, Joanne, uh, sorry, Joanne, I don't say it because you are here because I, you know, I also said, wrote in my book, because you said in one article that uh, the court should operate as a catalyst of information. And I do think it's really what the court of justice could do. So without finishing, without really maybe uh, overcoming, uh, exceeding the barrier of the scientific expert, of the, ex of the analysis of scientific expertise, the court of justice should verify, and I think that's what the court is trying to do if the decision has been taken on the basis of the good information. And on the other point that you raised on the urgency and the speed of the events, um, I think that's the biggest challenge. Of course, not, all, not only and not also for, 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 for lawyers and for the legal domain, but in general uh, for, for our society. And the answer that law shall give, the, the relationship between law and time is an incredibly interesting and fascinating uh, topic. And again, I go back to the project that we are, on which you are going, we are working on with Hélène and Valérie, in which we try somehow to engage in this notion with law and time and to see how the present generation shall engage with future and past generations, so with past and future. Uh, if and how um, precaution is a good tool uh, to enhance with urgency, it could be. I think the, the idea of precaution is exactly to be, to offer a flexible tool to act when the scientific information is not enough and to act fast. Again, um, the paradox might be that if precaution is subject to such a long list of procedural obligations, one might wonder if this long list of procedural obligations is consistent with the need uh, to act fast. And it's what you can see if you think about the application of precaution, for example, in, COVID, in the cases of the uh, 
COVID-19 crisis. When precaution was applied, I think during the first wave in February 2020, even in the subsequent one in 2020, maybe it was already too late because it was not more a question of preventing the risks. The, the, the member states and the, the European institutions started to impose lockdown measures, containment measures to restrict uh, the different freedoms when the virus was already there. So it was no longer a question of preventing, but more of mitigating the risks. And then again, it's a question of timing. So I think that precaution should be applied before a risk, before a crisis. So when we are not in a situation of urgency, then you could say, and I'll stop here, if we are not already globally in a situation of urgency, and so which is uh, the place in prefer precaution with that. But maybe I, as Joanne said before, I want to remain optimistic and think that precaution is still a place, uh, still a role to play, and there's still time to act, even if uh, quickly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would like to give your discussant a, a right to reply. So I don't know, Joanne, whether you would like to challenge some of uh, Alessandra's answers. I, I, I don't want to challenge them because I want to leave the floor to other people. But I want to make one tiny comment really provoked by the conversation between uh, Nicola and Alessandra. So, so on the one hand, one can completely understand the, the impetus of the court to proceduralize and to render scientific, to, to make things look objective, to make them look less political. And by doing that, they managed to sweep the distributive questions under the carpet. And those distributive questions include the distributive question that you've identified, which is the impact on future generations. But it's not just the impact on future generations, it's the differential impact on different groups, it's the differential impact on different species, and so on. So maybe one of the things that you're trying to get towards is, even within a sort of proceduralization paradigm, the court is doing an imperfect job because of the way it's constructing the relevant interests within the precautionary principle. And I think that's important. I do think one thing that it could be really interesting to do, and I've never had time to do it, is to sort of see what we can learn from the legislative application of precaution. You know, do we see a different vision in the legislative application? If you think about precaution in the chemicals regime, for example, and the notion of socioeconomic concerns, which play a really fundamental part of EU chemicals regulation, does that take a different approach to these distributive questions? Are future generations coming in there? Are non-human species coming in there? So it would be nice to see whether one can identify values from the legislative arena that could actually, or from the treaty and the legislative arena, which could potentially help the court in a way overcome its fear of these distributive questions. But even if it remains fearful, the very least I think what you're saying the court could, as an information catalyst, at least be required to say, what is the impact on future generations? What is the impact on the groups? So to make, to, you can proceduralize some of the distributive aspects as well. I think that's a totally fascinating direction to take the work. And I enjoyed the, the, the exchange between you and Nicola very much. And I'm gonna stop because there are people in the audience too. Yeah, but now I turn to Nicola to see whether you would like also to, to... Uh, yes, I, I, I imagine that the case in point in the legislation is Article 60, uh, Paragraph 2 and 2 4 of the REACH regulations uh, that um, um, applies to uh, chemicals uh, displaying um, a certain level of threat, uh, carcinogenic or um, dangerous for reproduction. And so, uh, as a matter of principle, th these chemicals must be banned. Uh, or must be replaced by substitutes. And in case uh, substitutes are deemed to be too expensive, uh, the company producing or placing on the market the chemicals can uh, seek the authorization uh, to maintain placing on the market uh, in um, demonstrating that the um, uh, socioeconomic advantages prevail over the uh, environmental risks. Uh, so the, there is a classical wagging of interest uh, that has been uh, embedded in the fourth paragraph. So there, there, there is a case law uh, on, on the subject matter. So we, we, we are moving from um, a, a situation uh, under which uh, the, the, the risks are contained 
uh, leading to the ban uh, of the substance uh, to a situation under uh, exceptional circumstances that the weighing of interest could uh, lead to the um, maintaining the authorization to place uh, on, on market uh, uh, substance displaying uh, endocrine disrupting um, properties, for instance. Um, the, the two cases I mentioned are actually confirm your, your thesis is that proceduraliz proceduralization uh, favor a commission discretion. So in the two cases are won by the European Commission. Uh, the, the first case before the General Court Commission as a defendant, uh, the uh, action for nullification has been dismissed. Uh, uh, um, and second case, uh, the Commission also as a defendant, uh, the Commission won the case because client uh, earth um, uh, action for nullification is also dismissed. So that uh, um, buttress uh, your, your, your thesis, so to speak. Yes, thank you. I would like to know whether some attendees would like to ask questions. I see none in the chat or in the q and I may be wrong, but I see no open uh, question. I would be grateful that people let us know if they have uh, questions. Yeah, and uh, so there is uh, apparently one question or comment by Giancarlo Villela a book that starts and closes the analysis with reference to Leopardi is great. That's <laughs> good. <laughs> um, so the question is the relationship between experts and decision makers uh, is well analyzed in the book, but the point is that the Weber's observation on the potentially conflictual relations is still there. Is the precautionary principle in your opinion helping to create a balanced relation? Or on the opposite, is it deepening the conflict between experts and decision makers? And more, is the conflict more with political level or with the administration? A question for the author, but also if they will, for the panelists. So Alessandra, you have the floor, of thank course. Thank you, and thank you very much, uh, Giancarlo. Uh, just to uh, let you know, uh, Giancarlo is a friend, he's been, um, until very recently, a director general at the European Parliament, he came a few time ago at the Max Planck uh, for a presentation on the, uh, the administration of the, at the European Parliament. So uh, thank you for being here and for your question, Giancarlo. Um, what I, in the relationship between um, scientific experts and political decision makers, I would not speak of conflict, but more of uh, interaction. Or at least what the precautionary principle I think shows is that the interaction could be uh, could be um, more more or less favorable uh, to a sound decision? I would say like this. So uh, traditionally, the relationship between decision makers and the scientific experts in the frame of risk analysis has been conceived in a linear way. So there's a risk assessment, and then decision makers, based on the risk assessment, decide and adopt a certain uh, precautionary measure. What in reality the application of precaution means is that this relationship is uh, circular. So there's not possible to frame in this um, linear and uh, static way, but it's more a question of a circular interaction. That's also, also what uh, any years of social of scientific studies um, have, have shown. So uh, which means that the work of the scientific experts is, by, is influenced by the political ones, which frame the decision, which gives a mandate. And of course, the way in which the, uh, the, the analysis of the risk is framed and presented by the scientific experts as an influence over the decision makers. What is also true that in many cases, uh, this relationship might be uh, conflictual to use your work in the sense that there's something that does not work correctly. I take again the example of glyphosate because I think it's a good one. Uh, there have been many uh, studies showing that the expertise given by the European Food Safety Authority on glyphosate um, was missing independence and transparency that is mainly based on the, on the, on the documents produced by Monsanto and that the scientific expertise itself was for, big, for more than 90% a copy paste of Monsanto uh, documents. So 
as an outcome, this, the expert is given by, well, as an outcome, one might wonder if the expert is given by EFSA is consistent with the principle of independence and transparency. And so if the decision taken by the European Commission that in 2017 decided to renew glyphosate uh, is, a good, is consistent with and is in line with the precautionary principle. In these cases, the relationship might be conflictual in the sense that there's something that went wrong in the relationship between scientific experts and political decision makers. And the same will applies very likely uh, this year for the new authorization of glyphosate. I was reading a few years ago uh, that uh, last summer, a pre-report by the um, by the four states which are preparing this IT, the pre-report the pre on the on the expert on the on glyphosate before. The European, the European Food Safety Authority will render its own. Um, it's supposed they are, the, at least there are doubts as to the legitimacy and to, again, to the independence of these studies, the pre-report study. So the story seems to be repeated again, um, but it's again an example of how the relationship could be uh, more or less uh, conflictual. Thank you very much. And the discussants were also invited uh, eventually to answer. I don't know whether they would like to say anything. No, Joan, Nicola. Okay. So I don't well, know. Well, I, I, the, the relationship has never been harmonious um, in the field of pollution, in the field of uh, nature conservation. Uh, I. I I imagine that uh, at the outset, the, the, the whole uh, environmental uh, regulatory trend has been uh, pushed by uh, scientists, uh, uh, often by citizen science. And so, uh, in particular, there's always been a gap uh, between the expectation from the scientific world regarding a better control of risk and uh, the regular regulatory outcome and this is very uh, obvious in the field of climate change uh, the, um, the the level of threat uh, has so far not been taken seriously enough by decision makers for, for a number of reasons because it will entail significant uh, societal and economic changes and we are not yet ready for this. Um, so uh, again, the, the, the complexity is, is relates to the uh, to the number the number of uh, policies uh, the EU uh, does uh, regulate, uh, ranging from fisheries to uh, nuclear installations. So now it's difficult to conclude on an optimistic note, uh, Alessandra. <laughs> I think it is it is your task to try to to. Uh, I don't know whether you would like to to add uh, anything. And uh, in an event, uh, if there are no further questions and there is none in in the chat, to invite you maybe to 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 say a few words of conclusion. But what I would say by conclusion, I will not thank you, you all of you again, but I will say that um, complexity like crisis can be seen as a failure of the law uh, to create uh, harmonious uh, rules or the failure of the law to regulate in the case of a crisis, a certain event. Um, so we might say that COVID-19 and climate change is a failure. And it's, of course, it's a failure because we've been knowing about climate change since the 70s and no action has been taken until today. COVID-19, so we are working on this topic also with Joanne, is the result of many interferences between environment and um, health risks. So yes, uh, it's a failure. But I also think, and I will conclude the land on a positive note, that might also be a challenge a challenge and then a way of, of evolution uh, for both the legal world for what we are concerned here in, our, in this personally, but also for society in general. The ecological transition, uh, the post-COVID transition is, a, it is already becoming uh, a way for our legal system to evolve, to think about new tools, new ways of, this, of, the, of, of interaction. And just an example, the new package of measure uh, that have been adopted in the framework of the European for Health, they have not ever been adopted without COVID. And if public health is taken, will take a more important role in EU law legislation is because of COVID. 
And it's really a tiny, tiny example. And without, and despite, as Nicolas said before, the fact that we are really running late, uh, I think that the, the Green Deal might be uh, a good way, a good chance really uh, to enhance and to think about uh, the, uh, the next 50 years. So time is, is short, but again, but time with by the crisis, European Union has, has was born. Thank you to us. Thanks to a subsequent number of crises, and I do hope, and maybe it's my optimism here, that climate change and these environmental and health issues that major issues we are facing today will be uh, will give have a chance uh, to do more and to do better. Yeah, and in any event, do not. <laughs> <laughs> to read the book it's a nice book it's it's all yellow it makes you think of uh, spring and uh, despite uh, all, all what we heard uh, indeed crisis and failure are two different things indeed and, and good changes can come out uh, crisis so probably crisis is a very ambivalent term whereas failure is a very negative uh, one so we have to reflect on, on this uh, it is time for me to thank very much the discussant, Professor Joanne Scott and uh, Professor Nicolas de Sadler for their uh, uh, participation in, in this event, for uh, teasing uh, Alessandra and, uh, and uh, giving, helping in, in this uh, fascinating uh, discussion. Uh, I hope the attendees enjoyed it as much as I uh, did. And uh, uh, it is time also to, to thank Alessandra for having uh, participated in this uh, alumni ev event, uh, showing that uh, now uh, our institute, which is almost uh, 10 years old, uh, as uh, as people were growing in, in, in the field, and it's very encouraging to for all the young researchers who are now at the institute. Thank you very much, uh, Alessandra. So thank you, Hélène, and thank you again, Joanne, Nicola, and all the other attendees for taking the time uh, to be here and listening uh, to, the, to this topic. Thank you. Congratulations, Alvaro. Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, to all of you, and uh, I say goodbye and thank you. Bye bye. And I will share my screen so that you can see the wonderful book of uh, Alessandra on uh, your screen. Bye bye to everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.